employers need highly qualified and diverse talent to grow. Unmuddle is a marketplace to help you with workforce and upskill needs. To learn more, go to unmuddle.com slash employers. That's U-N-M-U-D-L dot com slash employers. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Edup Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio here with you again. We are somewhere around 380 episodes as we record this uh, podcast uh, with my very, very special, and I mean very, very special guest that I'm uh, really honored to bring in. This is a bonus episode. Um, we we really uh, have a, are going to have a great conversation today. So uh, stay tuned as I as before I bring him in. I'm going to talk with myself, as you guys know I like to do. Of course, please check out our website at www.edupexperience.com. We've interviewed like 140 college presidents now. We we were first trying to get to 100, and now it's like 200. We're going to try to get to 200 college and university presidents and figure out what all these colleges are doing in this great time of disruption. And we're going to talk about some of that disruption today with my very special guest, uh, as I said. Here he comes. I'm going to bring him in right now. Ladies and gentlemen, his name is Mike Kamoyne. He's director of the upcoming documentary series, Scared to Debt. Mike, what's happening? Yo, great to be here. And congratulations on your milestone here. You're hitting the 300 mark, and that's just terrific. Thank you. It's a lot of talking. You know, you're doing a lot of filming, and I'm doing a lot of talking. So, you know, it's, uh, I guess you have to have a passion for this stuff. But you've, you've um, done something um, very important for uh, higher education, and you're profiling an issue that we all know is an issue. If you work in higher education and you don't think student debt is an issue, then you're not paying attention, right? So you have the upcoming documentary series uh, called Scared to Debt. Set, set the tone for us, Mike. What is Scared to Debt besides the obvious, right? What does it focus on and where did the idea come from? So uh, the idea came from when a woman came up to me, I run a film lab called the Northeast Filmmakers Lab. Uh, here in upstate New York, Albany. And she said, you have to make, you have to tell the story. You have to help millions of borrowers. I said, well, what is it, Cynthia? She says, it's on student loans. And I want to introduce you to Alan Collins. He's written a book called The Student Loan Scam, which was published by Beacon Press in 2009. So, you know, I'm not a fast reader, Joe. So I got the audio version and I would listen to the book as I would ride my bike. And I found that I was getting angrier and angrier as I was listening to this and how Alan had put together this story of what's actually transpired over the last couple of decades. And that is um, a predatory lending system behind what, you know, your prime audience, the presidents, these are folks that I, I, I'm just so glad that we're getting to talk to them because I think they can play a big role in solving this. Uh, what is a $1.8 trillion problem now for our country. And, you know, at this time, this was uh, five years ago, and I knew that my two kids, my wife and I have two kids, would be uh, entering into college. And we would soon be facing these student loans. You know, we consider ourselves middle class, but we're not going to be able to write a cash check to fund college like most Americans. And I said, oh, I know too much about this system. These loans are actually quite dangerous. Um, the Brookings Institute did a study um, that 40% pre-pandemic, 40% of borrowers are either in forbearance or default. So there's a, it, now we're in a pandemic and that's been a game changer. That's been a lot of challenge for universities and presidents and trustees. And um, so this is really pushing the issue to the forefront. So again, thank you for having me on. Um, the, you know, the, the impetus came out of that. And then from there, I just met all these different people who were also in looking at this issue for over decades. Uh, member of this uh, board of Sally May, uh, Catherine Fitz. Uh, I got to interview Ralph Nader. Uh, who was highlighted in the 1971 Powell memo, which attacks college campuses 
um, and made him, uh, you know, the number one target, an articulate, educated guy out of Harvard uh, who was, they were claiming at the time, a threat to the American corporation. Um, Bob Hildreth is a former uh, member of the World Monetary Fund looking at this problem. Uh, John Oberg, the whistleblower inside the Department of Education, um, who discovered the overbilling by the loan servicers, and they were covering this up. And at the end of the day, uh, he says that the Department of Education is complicit in all of this. So when you start to lay all that out uh, in front of colleges, college presidents, and professors who are unaware of how these students are sitting in their classroom because of these student loans. This is something we can't ignore, Joe. Uh, we just, we have, and we haven't dealt with this squarely. Mm -hmm. So that's what the documentary is trying to do is, is bring this to light. So as you're doing research, and I'm, I'm sure a good part of your research was you talking to a neighbor who has kids saying, hey, is this a problem for you, right? Because, because you have to discover, I don't know, the range and how it affects normal families and, and people who come from underserved backgrounds and how debt has impacted them. Is there anybody that comes out and goes, yeah, I took out debt and, and I'm good. Like, I, I understand that was a part of the process. Or is it, is it more of a debilitating issue where we just have students who left college and maybe didn't finish and now they're staring at big loan amounts and don't have anything to show for it? Where, where did the research take you? Right, right to my closest friends. Uh, because as a filmmaker, you know, they're always asking me, well, what are you working on next? And I said, well, I'm, I'm looking at this issue of student loans. And so Reggie Harris, African-American, American singer, songwriter, sang at our wedding. He nice. goes, I got student loan debt. And I said, how did you get that? Because he goes, I co-signed on my nephew's student loans. Hmm. And then he mysteriously was thrown into default. So, and he was a stellar student. And so now Reggie's on the hook for these student loans. He's a singer. Um, his life, he should be moving on in his life. He's, you know, he's getting up there, still producing albums. Uh, sang with Pete Seeger. Uh, I happen to be able, we do a lot of music videos together. Um, one recently called High Over the Hudson, which is a tribute to Pete Seeger here in the Hudson Valley. Um, you know, and musicians, they don't have the, less, the wherewithal to take on the the predatory fees and things like that that come with these loans so now you're you've fallen down the rabbit hole and you don't know how to get out another friend of mine said oh my kids have that they have two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars in debt and you know you gasp at that because these are your friends this is now um real and that motivates me more to continue in this documentary process, which at this point is, you know, five years in, we have our first pilot, which is Sally May Not, and we'd like to finish a six part series because there's just so much here, it's very complicated. And it's hard to explain uh, to the American people that this is not a bad borrower problem as yeah, it how, was five years. Yeah, let me interrupt you there because that you hit on something that you know I think it's a it's a part of. Um, I don't want to say it's, it, you know, when we look at personal responsibility. You know, there are people that when you talk about student debt, there is a contingent of folks that say, "Hey, look, that's that's part of that's on the student. Part of that's on the student for bad decision making. You know what? If you have two hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt, you shouldn't have sent your student to the school that charges that much. If you have you're in default, then you should have paid your loans." Um, what responsibility does the student have in the greater scheme of things? And what responsibility does the university have? You know, where does the, where does the pendulum sort of fall, if that makes sense? Yeah, does yep, the pendulum totally. fall? I don't think a pendulum so, so, falls. Swing might be a better Oh, answer. it swings, right? Yeah. I, I get you. Um, there's a guy who discovered 
Alan and then us in the film, and he came on to help executive produce. He's never executive produced a movie before. His name is Tom Borgers. And he was appointed by, during the Obama administration, to investigate the mortgage lending crisis. He's a Wall Street banker, financial fraud protector. And the first question he asked is, who has fi financial fiduciary responsibility in the banking industry? And what we discovered in the mortgage lending crisis is that we need to have the banks responsible for lending people money who can't afford to get into those mortgages. So he describes it this way, that the bank is the university and that if they were, these are hard words, if they were in a, if they were in a banking system, they would be responsible for lending people money and that they could be locked up and go to jail for lending people money they could not pay back. So he's interviewed hundreds of people and he's asked them one simple question. Did anybody ever ask you, could you afford this money? And the answer is 99% of the time, nobody's ever asked whether or not they could afford to pay it back. So that that's on one end of the spectrum, Joe, uh, or pendulum. On the other end, you, you know, the borrower is responsible for what they're buying. But we're talking about teenagers who don't know what questions to ask. We're talking about um, legal forms. That's it. It's in a small print. We're also talking about bursar's office that don't spend time with kids and say, these are the consequences. We need to go over this with you. That even if it's ten or twelve thousand dollars, this could grow to thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars. Oh, by the way, you can't get out of these loans because statute of limitations were removed from these loans, such that they will be with you for life. And even if you're a veteran, you're not getting out of these loans, and you can't file for bankruptcy because that was removed in 1998 for federal loans and in 2005 for private loans under different political groups and, you know, uh, Democrat, Republican, uh, this has taken a couple of decades to create this crisis. You know, the, the, the interesting, it's so many things go through my mind. As I said to you before the episode uh, started, I've got 20 years in higher ed and both for-profit education, which um, a for-profit education companies and then nonprofit education companies and in in colleges, right? One of the fascinating things that happened in the for-profit sector that really really hurt students was um, this thing called a gap loan, because the the for-profit um, um, educational schools were are held to a 90-10 standard, and, and that standard says you have to, you can give 90% of your money through financial aid, and then 10% has to come through cash or or some other revenue stream. And so I remember when when I was in I'm mean, as a young kid in the for-profit space, and we increased tuition by the by 10%, and said you can get a loan for 20,000 and 2,000 has to be cash so that we could hit the 90 10 regulation and what we did is we took that 10 percent and we financed it through a third party through institutional loans or through i don't know whatever private company loans. yeah private loans that had an 18 to 25 percent interest rate and you were just looking at these going oh god you know what but you, the school didn't have much of a choice because it had to hit this regulation because it's very heavily regulated in the for-profit sector and so you look at an issue like that, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sitting on a soapbox here, the federal government also allows students to take out much more than the cost of tuition. They, so, you know, at my last university, we, our tuition rate for a, for a, a full-time student, for a graduate student was like, I don't know, oh gosh, um, uh, $3,800. But for that $3,800, they could qualify for $6,000 in federal loans. Well. Most students took the $6,000. They didn't take the 3800 and so they've got all this extra money for living expenses, and then you have this big student debt program that grows because people don't know any better. They just go, oh, yeah, this money's available to me. I'm going to take it. So there's a big financial literacy problem. So anyway, there's like rocks 
that you have to overturn to get at the root of this problem. What do you think about all that? Well, it's very convenient <laughs> to steer people towards a private loan at 18 to 25%. And again, it goes back to how much, you know, how well was the borrower informed? Um, well, when, when it's 2000 bucks and an 18% interest rate, you just go, well, oh, it's only $2,000. But then that student that then you have amortization that takes place and all of a sudden that 2000 becomes 8000 and 10000 because there's the other 20000 that you have so private loans are tough they're tough to to get out from under them you know what i mean oh totally there's um a subject in our documentary his name is mike mcgurk um very talented filmmaker uh goes to the university of chicago and he tells us his story about how he took out a mixture of private loans and then he's in he graduates and he's in brooklyn and he's trying to hold on to his apartment in dumbo that has this beautiful view of manhattan and he's putting his rent on credit card and now you're going oh no don't do that so people young people are being squeezed into making even worse financial decisions for themselves so you've got credit card debt. You've he may have paid off his paid his, some of his student loans on credit card debt. In addition to the apartment, it's he's moved out. Of, I can tell you a fast forward. He's moved out of his apartment. Um, it became uh, untenable. Um, and if you know how hard it is to get an apartment in New York, <laughs> it's the last thing you want to do is lose it. So. You know, here's the thing. Um, this is creating a problem in so many different sectors of our economy, um, such as Mike, who's who's you know going to eat ramen noodle soup uh, ten years after he's got this wonderful master's degree from the University of Chicago, and uh, it it's not what people signed up for or dreamed about, and these are creative people. These are the future problem solvers. These are the people who are going to help us uh, come up with uh, being a better country, having a better community and, and all of this. Joe, I can go anywhere. Uh, I was at the Sundance Film Festival on another film called We the Animals, uh, which won a top award. And I'm in this Airbnb and, you know, you get to talk to other people because they're also there. And I'll just tell them I'm, I'm you get talking about your project. Everybody's got student loans, and and these people they were just gonna they were gonna go to the film festival to watch films, uh, you know, some were on vacation, you know, for skiing, things like that. But I could you could have this conversation anywhere, uh, even on my way out of the parking lot, <laughs> you know, I could talk to the handyman, and he could tell you that his kids got student loans, and he just realized how much this affects small town communities everywhere and and how this holds us back because if you're going to carry this kind of debt for longer than 10 years that's really going to affect some of your lifestyle choices you know we're hearing people not getting married they're living at home they're not buying a home they're not going to have kids they're not buying appliances they're not going to go out and buy that harley davidson motorcycle for their first you know vehicle all of these things, it just has a ripple effect and it's a lot bigger. Um, take real estate. The National Association of Realtors held a webinar the same day we had one of our first screenings at USC, October 14th this fall. It was a two hour webinar, uh, which I found extremely interesting, but they assessed the impact of all this debt on the realty market alone. It's holding back the economy $225 billion. If you fix this, you're going to see a bump of 220. These are the 20 million people who carry loans right now who cannot qualify even for a, a small mortgage. And like we said, you don't own a home. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. You can't sign up for to get an auto loan, you know, other things like that. So it, it's having a reverse effect. Uh, that we wanted, I think, out of the Higher Education Act of 1965. 
So tell me about the documentary now. Are we talking about multiple episodes here over over time? How is it structured? And, um, you know, when can we check it out? How do we check it out? You know, what's give us all the, the, the dirty little secret details. Sure. Uh, so Tom Borgers, our Wall Street fraud specialist, said there's four culprits. Um, and working backwards, it's the borrowers, right, making bad decisions for themselves. But it's also the universities uh, that historically were complicit with the birth of Sally May in 1972. Um, you know, they were on board with with all of this. Uh, and therefore, that's why I feel like they can help solve this. Um, and, and the government, the Department of Education, Congress. Uh, so we look at all of these uh, different culprits and how how did we get here? Uh, you know, the turning point for us, Joe, is 1972, when we create Sally May, we, Sally May privatizes, and a few years later, Albert Lord joins them, this uh, accountant from graduate from uh, Penn State, who then becomes the CEO, who says, I'm not going to run this unless I get to privatize this and we get to go for profit, and his eyes light up, and this is like a constant ATM. Uh, so by 1998, he gets his wish and um, they go for profit and um, he starts, he ultimately takes a $300 million parachute when he leaves Sally May and builds himself a private golf course. The vision of Unmuddle for the future is that the high cost, rigidity, and uncertain reward of pursuing higher education would be replaced with an economical, transparent, infinitely adjustable sequence of lifelong learning stints in which the employer, college, and learner are in constant communication about current needs and the system can respond quickly to each. Employers need highly qualified and diverse talent to grow. Unmodel is a marketplace that will help you with workforce and upskilling needs. To learn more, go to unmodel.com slash employers. So uh, woven in there are borrower stories, uh, scholars. Um, the first episode being Sally. Well, right now it's Sally May Not. Uh, then we want to cover John Oberg, who's our whistleblower in our second episode. The third episode, we want to look at Wall Street. Um, we're hoping that uh, an author named Josh Mitchell, who just wrote the book Debt Trap, um, I think it's called How, Debt Trap, How Student Loans Became an American Catastrophe. Um, in the fourth episode, looking at how universities and borrowers came a part of this. And then fifth episode, we're going to look at the fallout, you know, all the things we just started talking about. And uh, then the sixth episode, we want to look at solutions. There's a lot of viable solutions to this but it as frank buckley who's uh the professor at uh george mason university says you need you, this is going to require a scalpel um college is good but the lending instrument looks a lot like a scam you know someone said to me one time that the, that the feds may not want to fix the student loan issue because they're making 300 million on interest, right? They, they keep lending and lending and lending and students keep paying and paying and paying. And so there's all this interest money that comes in to the federal government and for their, in their best interest from a financial perspective, they're making all these dollars on what they've lent out. You know, and you go, how deep does this go? Like, how, where does this, it's, it must go deep. Yeah, I think anytime a problem doesn't fix itself, <laughs> like over a couple of decades, this is impact this. Joe, I scratch my head when, um, and Josh Mitchell covers this, you know, the highest paid political government official in the United States is the football coach of Alabama, mm -hmm. Nick Saban, who makes $10 million. So what's what happened just this fall? Well, LSU plucked Kelly from Notre Dame out. They're going to pay him nine and a half million. And then USC took the coach out of uh, Oklahoma 
and they're going to pay him 10 million plus two houses, one in LA and then one someplace else. Or they bought his house yep. for $500,000 over the price. A lot price. of money in football, but, that's for sure. Yes, there is. But this was supposed to be a nonprofit education institution. I, I'm a big sports fan, but somehow, somewhere, the ripple effect of all that wasn't the football team supposed to benefit the rest of the school and not just this one individual professor on campus, professor, coach, who's making $10 million? Uh, that just, there's just something that only this system allows that to happen. Um, and to me, that when you look at Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, and they've got default rates of 40%, or higher that still sustains this sort of athletic. I thought the I thought the football team was supposed to go benefit and make sure that these students are not falling down into the student loan debt trap. You know, there there is no give back. And and that was the original intention of Sally May is that we were going to take all that interest and we were going to give it back to the colleges and the colleges were going to make college more affordable. That's not happening. The federal funding has has dried up states are drying up and so now that decision in 1972 to pass the burden to the individual borrower to sustain college that decision is the reason why we're at the juncture that we're here and that was based on according to dr Shermer, who wrote the book indentured students uh that was based on the 1934 federal housing act where you you use government guaranteed loans to make allow everybody to get into a home they adopted that and said well let's get everybody into college and we'll 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 guarantee the loans but along the way they removed consumer protections they, they removed the statute of limitations so now these loans stay with you for life and that is that's harming black students and women disproportionately 500% over their white counterparts. That's yeah. It's significant. They're, 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 yeah. It's, it needs to be talked about. You know, one, a couple of things that you said there about, but uh, Saban, Alabama, you know, your, your point about, about, you know, this is supposed to be a nonprofit, you know, there's this, the, and we've talked about it in the, at the edup experience, quite extensively is this commoditization of higher ed rather than it continuing to be what it was supposed to be originally, which is a public good, right? So it's a commodity now. It used to be a public good. We need to turn it back to being a public good, but everything is commodity. You know, the, the football team's a commodity. It's a commodity for TV stations and it's a, a yeah. commodity for for ticket sales and, and all of these things. So it's pri it's like a privatized product right? Product development right. Is, is really what's happening. And then you, you you wonder what the solution really is. I mean, is the solution free college? I mean, we keep trying to pass free college initiatives. They never really go anywhere. Right. Um, you know, how do you get around this? How do you, how do you, you know, and that there's that and then, and then is the result, which I think it is the result is we all this debt happens all these lives are destroyed many people are having these issues and paying debt for so many years and then they go you know what was college even worth it because i'm oh, stuck with yes. this and so now we and i say we higher education administrators are dealing with the, one of the biggest messaging and marketing struggles we will ever deal with which is trying to prove the value of higher education to people that are questioning it this is continuum that's continue it's going on you know what i mean I, I totally get it. Um, you know, in the film business, I do uh, other gigs on the side. I do location scouting, and I had the opportunity to scout for the head of the NYU film department. And, oh. so, and I had his colleagues all in the back of my car while we were we were uh, scouting uh, fairgrounds, the old classic style fairgrounds in upstate New York. And they were asking me, hey, Mike, what are you, what are you working on? And I started to tell them about this project. This was three years ago student loan debt. And uh, they were like, this topic comes up all the time, I'm trying to figure this out. You know, you know, we know we're charging 65,000 
a year for undergrad and graduate has probably gone up. And we, this question is just, is just, we're constantly trying to figure out what is the value of our education. And even with USC, you know, at least in my industry, just because you've got a degree in film does not mean you're going to be successful. There are so many other things you need to do to hustle to make it in the film business uh, and to justify the cost. Hopefully you're going to make the business connections and you're going to learn the skills, but you, you can't control a down market. You can't control it when a, you know, the mortgage crisis and, and you can't control a pandemic which shut down the film industry. uh, And you hit on a really big issue that we talk about in higher ed all the time, which is how do you really define an ROI to a student? You can, if they, if they come in and they want to be an engineer, it might be a clear path. If you're a film director or you're a major in speech communications, like I did, it might be a little bit harder to define that ROI. And that's difficult for kids to understand. And it's difficult for parents to understand what's ROI and what's not and how you define it. And when do I get it? And, you know, it's this whole paradigm that we're all working through together, um, maybe ineffectively. I don't know. It's it's a big problem. Yeah, it is. Um, and I think here's what we know. Well, here's what I know is that also by creating the structure that we have now, where it, in fair lending, it's the government has a third, the borrower has a third. Um, and the bank has a third, let's say. Um, we know now that uh, the university has no, they're not really res- held responsible. The federal government isn't held responsible. All the risk that we just talked about is on the borrower. And it used to not be that way. In fact, J- uh, Josh Mitchell talks about this uh, in his book, The Debt Trap. We're you know, his one solution is, can we go back to the early days where the university had responsibility? So they had some responsibility for giving out these loans, which meant you don't want to put kids into degrees that are not employable, maybe make that a minor. Um, And that's something they can pursue further later in life. But somehow balancing the scales here is really important. uh, you, you know, and to... again, where we're heading is is really towards a, the a very challenging time, uh, and the pandemic is only um, accentuate. You know, made one that... of the hopes is that the competitive landscape of higher ed, and I talk about this extensively. It's the most competitive time higher ed has ever seen, for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's just a lot less traditional high school students going into college. There are the pandemic has created a lot of fallout. And, and so now you have everybody, you know, there's online learning and there's a, it's a, it's a competitive time and you hope that some, that at some level competitiveness, let me try that again, competitiveness drives down the cost because somebody says, oh, we're going to do it for 5,000 less. And then somebody else says, we'll do it for 6,000 less. And it becomes this declining cost market. We're waiting for that to happen in certain, in, in higher ed, but, but then you, you take that and then there are just some schools that don't have to do that because they're brand rich, they're brand strong. You know, your McDonald's, well, that's a bad example, but your McDonald's um, is one of the biggest real estate companies in the world. They own all the real estate that their buildings are on. And so a school like Harvard or our other Ivy Leagues, they don't have to reduce a price. They don't have to because a student that goes to Harvard is looking for an elite education. But what about everybody else? And how do they come out of a college experience primed for success is a big question that we're wrestling with. Joe, I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of share what Bob Hildreth says, uh, formerly with the World Monetary Fund. Um, he says, in the future, college is going to go to $100,000. Um, and what you're going to see, and I've read this, it's the mid-level colleges that we're going to lose. They're currently running at a deficit already. They're trying to compete. They don't, their identity, uh, uh, are we a big college or are we a small college? The small ones who are, are either going to drop out or figure out that their identity and they're learned to stay small yet be big um, in what they do. Um, and so you're, I think about that and I think about, okay, so in upstate New York, Ithaca College let go 
uh, hundreds of professors last year. Um, it was coming, you know, it, this, this was building. Uh, there's other schools uh, locally here who uh, College of St. Rose let go of some musician professors. Um, and they got a great music program. It's like one of the top 10 in the country. And they're shedding professors. You know, the impact of that on a small town, like in Ithaca, New York, that's that's an economic driver for 200 people to no longer be employed or 300 people no longer be employed. You know, that's pensions, that's uh, retirement, that's people who are gonna stay in the community longer. Uh, it's just, I, I, you know, what's coming? I, this definitely has to be solved. Uh, it, it, I don't think, I guess, I don't believe that people will lower their rate. They haven't even lowered them during the pandemic. <laughs> or, and, and, and let me just bring this back to political. Like even my friends on the right are asking this one question, which is why does college cost so much? And I, I, I think America hasn't had that really, that conversation. You've had it here, um, but it needs to be happy. People need to understand that the federal government and states don't support colleges the way they used to. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned that free college. Well, that's going to get shot down because the private schools don't want to see that to happen. Uh, there's so many, there's so many people who don't want to see one thing happen or another. Uh, and it's unfortunate. So I say as a dad, give me something I can sign on that I know it's fair, you know, uh, in terms of something that protects my daughter and my son and my wife and I as if we're going to have to be co-signers on this. Like I said, I know too much. These are like the worst credit cards you could ever sign on to. Yeah. So th this, this has been a great conversation, Mike. Plug away. I want you to plug your documentary because I can guarantee you that our audience will be very interested in checking this out when we can. So when can we and what's it look like timeline wise? Joe, thank you. I would love if anybody's listening, if they would like to have something like this, like a screening online. Uh, we have our first episode, Sally May Not, which won the Whistleblower Summit uh, in July 2021, the uh, Audience Award. It's it's screened at USC Film School, which is quite an honor. We'd love to host online screenings. And, and then afterwards, what we do is have panel discussions, just like what you and I had uh, here and talk more about the film. Uh, they can find me at, I'm at videosforchange.com. Uh, you can reach me, Mike, at videosforchange.com. They can go to the website, scaredtodebtseries.com, specifically for the film. And, um, you know, we try to post as much, keep people up to date on what we're doing there. And like I said, we're, we're screening this film, Joe, um, January 28th through the 31st, uh, you know, Democrats abroad are hosting a screening, so we're going international, and nice. people can even find sign up for that. Um, and um, and I think we just need to have this conversation. We've got a few months here during the the pandemic pause that let's dive into this. Um, and then there, if there's anybody that wants to help fund the, the completion of the series, uh, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders here. Let's get this done. Let's put this out there. Let's, you know, like I said, there's going to be an episode direct um, solely on solutions, not just the problems that you and I talked about, but coming out of this with solutions. And we want to hear from people and put them in front of the camera who have those solutions that can, uh, I think, benefit America and flip this around and, and let's make education the public good that it is. It's a great opportunity, uh, you know, to better ourselves. Uh, but let's make sure that everybody that goes to college is able to come out on the other side um, and, and have some safeguards, have some rails on this that gives college and going to college and higher education a better name. Because the question is out there, is this really a worthwhile thing right now? And, and I think the stakeholders, the people who care about education, um, the presidents, uh, boards, trustees, these are the folks who I think might want to know a little bit more about what they're 
getting and and it's going to help there be sustainable because right now from the people the indicators are that this is not sustainable so that's a big that's a big topic it's a big question and thank you for having me on and allow me to well, I've got a lot of respect. You know, Elvin and I started the EdUp experience to have conversations that need to be had about higher ed because nobody else was having them, particularly with the people who are making the decisions. And so I have a lot of respect for you for having this very difficult conversation that literally, I mean, there's just a, a few issues, you know, in life where you talk to the person on your left and you talk to the person on your right and everybody goes, oh, I got that too. And student loans and student loan debt is one of those things that connects all of us. I mean, I still, I got a doctorate degree. I still pay back my back, my bachelor student loans. I think I got six thousand dollars left. The interest rate's so low, so I just pay. But I mean, still, it's there. I mean, you know. So, but you don't know that stuff till you get out. I mean, just until that first one smacks you in the face for four hundred bucks, and you go, "What the heck is this?" So, uh, so much respect for you, Mike. Again, here he is, ladies and gentlemen. His name is Mike Moyne. He's director of the upcoming documentary series, "Scared to Debt." Guys, check it out. It's "Scared to Debt" series. Dot com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming on, Mike. It was an honor. Joe, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, you just add up. Employers use Unmodel to source talent directly from community colleges with a click of a button to commission needed training to develop existing talent. Highly qualified and diverse talent is absolutely necessary to grow in today's workforce. Try your free subscription today at unmuddle.com slash employers.